Mike, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it. So can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Cook. I work for a company called SoCure. Um, we are a uh, identity verification company. Been around for about 10 years, VC backed. Um, we serve 1,500 customers. Most of them, you and your listeners know. Um, I can't really say the names because of NDAs, but um, non-disclosure agreements. But uh, if it's a big bank, if it's a card issuer, if it's a fintech, if it's somebody who's offering any kind of a loan online, they're likely our customer. And what we do is score their applications every day. Um, so in the course of a year, we score millions of credit applications to help them understand uh, if that application is fraud or if it's a good consumer, right? Because we don't want to impact consumers, uh, especially when they're trying to get uh, an auto loan or uh a credit card or a bank account online. And uh, so I've been doing this for uh, over 35 years. Uh, started uh, right out of college for a company called Chrysler Credit uh, in auto and was in credit. From there, I went into American Express and did fraud and have never looked back. Nice. So when it comes to online fraud and identity theft, have either you or anyone you know been a victim? Um, yeah, so it's interesting, right? I, I, um, I had mentioned that I'd started at Chrysler. So the, the first thing where, when I really got interested in fraud was less when I was a victim and more when I actually talked to the fraudster who defrauded the company. So there was oh, wow. a woman. Yeah, she had stolen five cars. Um, uh, we at Chrysler Credit had delivered five cars uh, to the Astrodome. I was working in Houston at the time. And her name was Carol Jones. She'd gotten cars under Carolyn Jones, under Carolyn A. Jones, and she had used all kinds of different social security numbers. So I finally got a hold of her, never did find the car, never was able to repossess it or get it back, right? But um, I was able to talk to her. It was really intriguing because uh, she thought it was funny, you know, and she thought that, you know, we were fools for delivering cars to the Astrodome. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I thought, you know, gosh, this is really easy and why, why can't people stop it? So I got really interested in it. And uh, it is interesting, though, in the last six months, um, I've always been extremely passionate about fraud. But in the last six months, uh, my daughter was a victim of a P2P, so a person to peer, a person to person, like a, a Zelle scam, mm -hmm. um, where she sent money to a government agency. She totally believed they were government. They had all the information on her talked to her for two days um, and she sent all the money that she had, which was about $900 um, and lost it. Uh, didn't, you know, wasn't able to get it back, called the bank. They said, sorry, you sent it out, you know, through a peer-to-peer a -peer, uh, program. And so she lost the, she lost that. And, and it really has fueled a new passion in me. Um, and, and mostly because not the money lost to her, um, but she was uh, fearful. Um, and she was upset and it was very emotional for her. So I guess, you know, it's it's one thing, you know, 35 plus years ago to have an interest. It's another thing that six months ago, again, you know, my my passion to solve for fraud really got uh, peaked. Yeah, it, it things change when it's when, when you go from theoretical and conceptual and a cup, a, a Fortune 500 company is the victim and it's fine, you know, it's. 1.01 percent of the company's you know earnings or something like that it's it's a it's a rounding error let's just figure out how to deal with it as opposed to it's a family member and it has real world impact and not just the financial impact but the the trust aspects and the the, the fear that it invokes in people yeah yeah especially when it's your daughter <laughs> and uh yeah i think the first thing i blurted out to her was you know what i do for a living why would you have done this right so so if you don't mind talking so what what got her over the hill of not trusting them to trusting them it was the they they basically had all her information and so that that was it she was like look it it, it seemed like a professional person it seemed like they knew everything about me right and they were just telling me that i owed these dollars and i didn't believe i did but then they they would talk to her about how it was going to be very embarrassing and she was going to get fines and have to go into court and her parents would get brought in. And so at that point, she just said, you know, whatever it takes, right. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me just pay you. And they basically kind of settled the fine on what she had in the bank, you know, which probably should have let her know that that was fraud. 
<laughs> we'll take what you have, right? But um, but yeah, so she she uh and she completely believed it for two days. And it wasn't until like she told me what happened and and immediately she was like, Oh my god, you know, yeah, I got scammed. So so it was more than just kind of the the random phone call of hey, person who answers the phone who I don't know your name, I'm the IRS and you owe me money, but they actually knew name, address, and, and more about her to make the story more compelling. Yeah, they called her. They called her. And, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I mean, if you've been doing fraud for this long, you, you, you track, right? And you see how good the fraudsters have gotten. And years ago, fraud was easier to stop. Um, they weren't as good. They, they weren't really... Uh, paying as much attention, right? And now with all the data breaches that have happened, um, most everybody's data is out there on the internet. And so if you can buy the data, you can buy, you know, some information from a, a, a data breach, right? So from a data breach, you would get your email and your password, maybe, maybe some clear. So then you could do something called credential stuffing, where I just send all that info to every bank that I know, right? And see if I can get it to open up the account. Mm -hmm. Um, or I can get fulls, and I, which fulls means I can get their social name, address, phone, date of birth, email, um, all the data about them. And so then, um, you know, they can do a better job at convincing people that, you know, this is a legit thing and you're really going to get in trouble. So you have to, you have to pay me. Is there, oh, you know, for most people in the U.S., is that data out there and readily available for the vast majority of us? Yes. Um, so the data is, I mean, if you think about some of the data breaches and, and I, I'm not going to name them, um, but because I think a lot of these companies have gone through pretty harsh times, you know, seeing stock hits and reputational risk, people have been fired, had to let go. Um, but there, there's been massive data breaches, you know, of, of 200 million plus with all the PII, personally mm -hmm. identifiable information. So all of the name, address, and social. Now, when that happens, it gets put out on the internet. Um, it gets sold, copied, sold, and copied, and sold, and copied. And it never goes away, right? And so if you think about your identity, uh, my name is my name. Uh, my social is my social. My date of birth is my date of birth. birth. Um, more and more, your email is fairly permanent. And with portable uh, portability of cell phone numbers, you know, that sticks with you. So your 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 identity really is kind of unique to you, right? And the more and more we make it to where it can be permanent, so you have that email, you have that phone number over time, it it just becomes yours. And so w with all of these data breaches, um, the data doesn't go away. And so yeah, it is it's fairly uh, available. You just have to know how to how to go out to the dark web, uh, go to some of these marketplaces and then, you know, make the purchase, download it. And hopefully you're not going to get scammed yourself uh, as a fraudster because <laughs> fraudsters get scammed too. So I, 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 I was about to say, I bet there's plenty of scams that take advantage of people that are new to trying to commit scams. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Sure. But there, and like you said, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people. There's um, ITA is a, a community group that we uh, we follow um, for financial services and fraud, and they've uh, they wrote a white paper a while back, just an ac academic research paper, and they talked about the citizen fraudster. So it's interesting. Um, Twenty years ago, you, you're kind of on your own, and and back when I do fraud investigations and I'd look at case studies and things like I could I could pick out and look at. This is some person in his or her grandmother's basement perpetrating fraud. And they're doing a terrible job, right? Yeah. Easy to catch, easy to catch, right? And then here, here's an organized ring and they know what they're doing, right? Today, that's completely different. And um, with forums that are out on the internet, um, with technologies that are shared, I mean, you can actually go out uh, as a person who wants to commit fraud and I can rent a server from a, uh, a fraudster that will help me do bot attacks so robot attacks where i'm constantly attacking people right and i can i can rent that capability i can i can buy the identities to put through it right and i can learn how to do it online so fraudsters have gotten really smart at teaching other people how to do that right they're making money they don't really care because they'll continue to do fraud too 
So um, there really isn't easy fraud to catch anymore. It's all very difficult. And it's made it hard, not just for lenders and banks, right? But for consumers like you or me or your listeners. So, you know, it, I, I think there's kind of two separate conversations. There's the, the lenders that are being taken advantage of and then the consumers. And so let's let's talk primarily about the, the consumer side of it, because not that I want to, not that I say no one cares about the corporations, but, you know, we're, we're talking to consumers listening here and, and they're they don't they're less concerned about what happens to Chevrolet and more concerned about what happens to their mom. Yep. So how, how does this impact individuals? So in a lot of different ways, there's so many different ways to perpetrate fraud, right? And, and let, let's, let's do this for consumers. Let, let's focus on the one scam that is probably growing. It's second fastest. If you look at the federal trade commission and the way they track um, identity theft is number one, but um you know, that's really, it's a little bit different. Let, let's talk about scams, right? So mm -hmm. it's the impersonator scam. I call you like the person did to my daughter. I'm the government, you know, you shouldn't do this. It's a romance scam. It's let me send you money. Uh, I don't have a bank account. Then you can keep a thousand dollars of it and send me back 10, right? So there's these scams that are happening. <clears throat> Oftentimes they are social, right? These guys, fraudsters like to do social engineering. It's a lot easier. People think about fraudsters. They think, oh, they're going to hack and they're going to do all this stuff. And right. Generally, they just talk you into stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the simplest thing is they're going to call, they're going to talk to you about something, right? And as a consumer, if it, you should listen, right? I mean, it is, if, if something sounds too good to be true, it is. And you should be very careful about what you do next, right? If somebody is using words like you need to pay immediately. And did you know this? And they're really trying to scare you. Right. And they're with a government entity. It is going to be fraud. It's likely fraud. And there's nothing wrong. Even if you literally hang up on the real person who works for the IRS, you just hang up on them. Just keep hanging up on them. Right. If, if it's a legit issue that you have to address, you can address it over time. Fraudsters are going to try and push and push and push and get you to respond like right there, right? When you're on the phone. So if you're a consumer and you answer the phone, be very careful if it's not somebody that you know, if yeah. it's not somebody calling you back. Um, the other thing is, if you're a consumer is, you know, clicking on things, right? And, and I, I think consumers might think, well, it's just in my email. If it, if it just comes in my email, I don't want to click on it. No. If you get a text, right? And that text says, oh, click here to win. Or gosh, we have this great story. You should click here. Or um, here's, uh, I'm Bank of America. You should uh, click here so that we, we have a fraud report on you, right? So there's these things where fraud should try and create a sense of immediacy in the consumer's mind. I've almost, I mean, this is what I've been doing for, you know, my lifetime. I've almost clicked on things, right? Because I've been like, oh, okay. And, and I'll start to click on it. And I realize that that's a, that's a scam. And uh, it can come to you through, uh, through a social network. It can come through your text. It can come through your phone, um, uh, on a phone call, right? There's so many different ways. I, I even got a, uh, uh, a piece of mail, and this is three days ago. And, and it was a good one because it, it looked legit. Um, I called the number. It made me go through a frustrating uh, process. Dial one for this, six for this, seven for that. And then finally, it gave me this new thing that said, give me your social and we'll get you to an agent. And I realized, I bet this is <laughs> fraud, right? So I put in a fake social and the recording said, thank you very much. We'll get back in contact with you and hung up. So thankfully, you know, I put in the wrong social, but again, you know, it is, uh, I've been doing this my whole lifetime and, and this is two, three days ago. I, I almost got, you know, defrauded. And so for consumers, it's very hard. I think you just have to be very hesitant to click on anything, very hesitant to say anything. Don't feel bad to hang up the phone. Don't feel bad to give out, you know, any information. Do not give it out. And there, there were, uh, someone in, I assume someone in our neighborhood uh, a couple of weeks ago went and put a uh, little piece of paper and, and taped on everybody's door and it was a QR code. Oh. 
and it just said, please help me reach my goal. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I'm not scanning that darn thing. I, I am not curious <laughs> as to what it is, but I can't imagine how, like maybe it was a legitimate fundraiser for something. I don't know. But like, I could see just like the desire of people. Like, I just want to know what it is. I'm going to scan it just to see what it is. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's a, you know, it, it may have been legit. Right. But t- to your point, I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to touch it, right? Because even if it, if it's legit, then gosh, I'm sorry to help you get to your goal. Um, but if it's not legit, it really could be bad because because they could insert malware on your phone. Then they have all your passwords. First thing they're going to do is go look in your notes section on your yeah. phone. A lot of people put their passwords in, right? And they're going to read to see if you have your passwords in your notes section, um, you know, or they're going to put on uh, something that collects your keystrokes on the phone. So yeah, it's, uh, it's really easy. It's really, it's a really easy fraud and it's going to continue to climb after COVID. It's really, yeah. it's really climbed quite a bit when the economy goes down, fraud goes up. Um, I think the economy probably is going to turn down a little bit, hopefully not too bad, but um, you know, consumers, those people listening can anticipate more and more and more of these kinds of scams. I've always been particularly maybe impressed is not the right word with the speed with which the scammers adapt to what's happening in the world. So as soon as the government announced, you know, free COVID tests, I started getting spam for here's how you get your free COVID tests. And I'm like, no, that's definitely not how you do it. And, oh, hey, we have this government refund program all of a sudden start getting scam emails about, well, here's how you apply for the, this government refund. They're, they're, they're faster about getting the process out to you than the government is. They are. And, you know, and I know, you know, talking about the, the organizations that secure protects, right. Um, It isn't, isn't like the consumer thing, but I think even consumers can understand, they may have heard the term machine learning and artificial intelligence, right. Just, Really, really fantastic data science. Well, it, in in the world that that we watch on a daily basis, where all these applications are coming through, it's interesting. Years ago, the behaviors changed every six eight months, right? The fraud behaviors. Let me, you know, mm-hmm. you figured out what I'm doing, so I'm going to change it, right? And then they start changing every month. And what we're seeing now is intraday, like in the middle of the day, they will change their behavior. So, like you're talking about, right, with consumers. But even with lenders, they, they change in the middle of the day. And, and I think they're using advanced machine learning, some really cool data science to start to try and get out ahead of those things that are trying to protect consumers um, that are used by, you know, big, big businesses. So, yeah, they I've been doing it for 35 years. Plus, um, fraud has never been harder to stop, mm-hmm. it has never been smarter it has never been swifter to change patterns. Yeah, it is uh, on fire right now. And, and to me, that's particularly scary that, you know, you're someone who's sitting kind of in the middle of the transaction and you can see what's being submitted. The, the fact that it's getting harder and harder to detect is, is alarming because the method, of, you know, like you said, what defines our identity isn't changing to evolve. It's it's been pretty static for quite a bit of time. Yeah, identity has been static for quite a while. The the biggest change was um, moving online. So the biggest change was COVID, right? So you know we saw, um, uh, gosh, I bet you, I, I bet you, without COVID, we would have we as an industry, right? As everybody that's that's working with consumers uh, would have would have slowly progressed to the internet, slowly progressed to, to more virtual relationships over the course of eight eight more years, I think. We're probably mm-hmm. taking years. Um, COVID took all that eight years and shoved it into six months. And so when you do that, you create huge gaps, yeah. right? And, and and huge need to learn. And so fraudsters they can just take advantage of, of any changes um, really, really rapidly. Um, so they can just, they can really change fast. Do you see that there's going to be a coming need to change kind of how the U.S. credit system works in order to uh, be able to take a 
I don't know, uh, a significant uh, effort to to stop fraud. You know, if it was like, if this one new thing were to be implemented, we could cut down fraud by 90, 95%. Is there something like that that needs to be implemented, is being thought about being implemented? Yeah, oh yeah, all the time, all the time. So, and it's crazy, right? So um, years ago, it, it used to be, you wanted the fraudsters to try and attack, attack you in a physical environment, right? And, and the, the conventional wisdom was, hey, look, a fraudster's not going to walk into a bank where there's, you know, locked doors, there's a person with a gun, there's cameras, right? And so we felt like uh, in a physical environment, you, consumers are a little bit safer, right? Because there's not as many fraudsters. Right? But online is the, it was the concern, right? Because it's, a fa- it's called a faceless environment, right? And it's easier to perpetrate that fraud. And so, you know, I think fraudsters have had... Um, uh, uh, um, kind of an early start uh, in that environment for years. But I'll tell you, I think as we get, you know, the phone, right? Um, and as this becomes, it is ubiquitous now. We, yeah. we all, you know, it, it's, I used to say, I think, you know, there'll be a point where technology is embedded in us. It doesn't need to be anymore. I mean, um, you know, Chris, how far is your phone from you right now? Yeah, it's uh, two feet away. Right. So it's embedded, right? This is just as good as being embedded in us. So, so that's when I felt felt like there would be a switch, right? Because then we have this, right? Fraudsters don't have it. They can they can do a SIM swap, which means they can basically kind of take over your phone. Um, so there's ways that they can kind of take advantage of this. Mm-hmm. But I think the better we get with device, right? Knowing that um, this device is in this location, that this device has an IP address that is in this area, right? That this device has an operating system that looks like this, right? Down to what time is it on my device, mm-hmm. right? Um, that that I've got maybe something, even a, an app here where I know that this is the device. So I think as, you know, the population ages, the younger people come in, they're more comfortable with their device. They're more comfortable with apps. They're more comfortable taking a a picture, right, and a picture of their driver's license and sending it in, right, which can can be defeated, right? Yep. But, you know, I think that as we get smarter, younger people are smarter about technology, I think it will, um, it's going to, we're going to catch up. I, with fraudsters, you know, I, I've always pictured it as a, as, as a, maybe some predator chasing a gazelle, Right. And you're chasing this gazelle who's the fraudster, right? And you're nipping, right? And you're lucky to be nipping on their heels, right? That That's good, right? Even if you don't ever catch them, as long as you're nipping at their heels and not running, you know, 100 yards behind them, right? So I think we will get better. Um, and one thing I'm pretty excited about is some regulatory changes that are coming that will help consumers. So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, mm-hmm. uh, was created under Obama, uh, his administration. Um, so they've come out and they're going to push the banks to accept the loss for P2P frauds. So when I sell you, right, and a hundred bucks, a $3,000, because I want to buy that pedigree dog off of Craig's, Craigslist, right? And then I never get the dog because um, I've been scammed. The bank is going to be responsible for that, right? So, you know, my banking friends don't like it. Yeah. Um, but what it does... <laughs> For consumers, and this, this is what's good for your audience, is it puts more of the stress on the lender, on the bank, right, to keep fraud out of yeah. their accounts. Because in banking, when I'm doing a P2P scam, that that's it's called a money mule. So a money mule is basically um, I'm here, send money here, I'm going to take that money and then I'm going to send it out here, right? So I'm just basically going to move that money amount yeah. around for fraudulent purposes and that's a money mule. In the past, they used to have money mules that were actual people and they paid the people, they either scammed them and they didn't realize they were being a money money mule or they were taking money to do it. Um, what we've seen, especially since COVID, there's a kind of fraud called synthetic fraud where it doesn't really impact consumers because it's not using their identity. Mm-hmm. But they, um, but that synthetic fraud is fake, and now that is the new money mule, and the banks haven't done as great a job as they can stopping those up front. 
now that the government is going to change regulations or the the banks will self-regulate themselves and take that loss the responsibility is there for them and the value is there for them to stop those losses up and make sure they don't have these money mules in their accounts so so for, so consumers should see banks working harder in 2023 and 2024 to help stop those p2p frauds on behalf of the consumers because it helps the bank not take financial loss gotcha so, so just to clarify with the synthetic fraud the scammer is creating a fake identity a, a fake entity <clears throat> that fake entity then goes and creates a bank account and then the money gets moved through that bank account it's not your not your bank account it's not my bank account it's a bank account owned by a fake individual right yeah, because right, because uh, think about it, right? If you're going to do something and, and you're going to get in trouble, I'm going to do money laundering, or I'm going to do you know terrible things like human trafficking or drug trafficking, or I'm going to scam people, right? I don't want to do that under my identity, so I just create a fake identity. Um, there's ways to do it right. Uh, I, I won't tell your audience no. how to do it right, <laughs> but there's ways that you can do that and and get through some defenses, right? And then you can establish a lot of those relationships. We, we believe, we've done a ton of research at Secure, we think anywhere from 1% to 3% of open active accounts, bank accounts in the U.S. are synthetic. Oh, wow. 1% to 3%. So think about that, right? In a group of 100 people, you got three people working against you, and they, they're not telling you they're doing that. Right? So, so th this is the, I don't know, the, the, the conspiracy theory side of me, or the, the don't trust big business. Shouldn't it be fairly easy for a bank to detect a synthetic account that's being used for a, a synthetically created account that's being used for fraudulent purposes because humans are very consistent about how they use their bank accounts they you know someone who gets cash they get this amount of cash on a regular basis every every so often they get their paychecks deposited and, you know whether they get cash or they get a paycheck they make deposits on a regular basis and make Zelle transfers on, you know, let, let's say, you know, once or twice a week, shouldn't the banks be able to detect, gee, there's been a hundred Zelle transfers through this bank account in the last 24 hours. Wouldn't that flag is suspicious? So it can or cannot, right? Think about that, right? So, so let's say number one, they should be able to stop it before it gets in. Synthetic fraud is not that hard to stop. It, it can get through. Right? I mean, it's, it's not easy, right? But so number one, you should try and stop it before it gets in. But if it does get in, um, think about this. You know, 91% of businesses in the U.S. are uh, small businesses with mm -hmm. less than three employees, right? 91%. So it's a huge chunk, right? And especially following COVID. Think about how many people that you know, right? How many people in your audience opened up an Etsy account or opened up some kind of a marketplace, right? So it's interesting where, um, yes, it's true. You shouldn't see 100 transactions come through for a day, but I'm sure there's some good Etsy, Etsy accounts, right, where they're seeing that many transactions, right? And so if I set it up as a synthetic account, if it looks like it's a commercial account because it's doing so many transactions and I've got a hundred going through per day, right, then you it may not look as suspicious. And, and you know, the, the, the banks and big businesses, they are kind of in this rock and a hard place, right, yeah. where they're all competing for consumers and yep. they're, they're competing for consumer spend. And so, you know, I, I don't want to anger a good customer, right? And especially if I'm doing hundred transactions a day, it's a lot of transaction fees, right? So if, if, if I anger you and you go to my competitor, then I've lost business, right? And so stopping fraud for consumers is this balancing act of how do I not bother you, right? Um, and really catch the bad guys. And, and the, 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 diff, the more difficult thing is the, the people who, the, so fraud looks a little bit like the underserved yeah, um, or the younger or the elderly or the new immigrant, right? And so you really have, so it's so pure like that. Something we really pay attention to is, is going out and making sure that if there's a new population, how can we do a better job of, of not impacting that population, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's I, that's always going to be the challenge with uh, a security product. Is security is an obstacle in some form, 
you have to make it an obstacle enough to prevent fraud, but not so much that it prevents your consumer from doing business with you. It, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, because because you know, I mean, I think we've all like, if you try and make a wire transfer uh, with some banks, um, I don't know how many times you get that. You know, hey, we're going to send you a code to your phone, right? So you can even during a wire transfer get get that code sent to you three times, yeah. right? And I think that that's probably a bank who is very concerned about fraud loss or they just don't have the right process in place um, because you can do that in a little bit more of a smoother operation. But again, you know, if you're the fraud manager, you know, you want to throw up as, as many <laughs> block, block as you can so that, you know, you don't, you know, take fraud. So are there, so, so here's a question for you in, in, in terms of, dealing with banks with good fraud, with good fraud uh, processes in place. Uh, my audience will be annoyed because I'm going to tell this story again. Um, I, I needed to send some money to family overseas and uh, the bank that I was working, that I primarily work with doesn't do international wire transfers. Um, partly by choice on my part, I didn't, there was intentional on my part, but I needed to send an international wire. So I had to open up an account with the bank, make a deposit in it, wait for the money to, to clear, and then turn around and wire most of it out to, you know, to a family member overseas. And I got a phone call from the bank within 24 hours from, from some very nice woman who wanted to make sure I wasn't being scammed. And she was oh, right. asking, who are you, why, you know, we noticed you just opened this account and you're already sending money internationally. Who are you sending it to? I was, oh, well, you know, family member. Are you sure that you're sending it to a family member that it's not a scammer? Have you like, when did the, when was the last, have you met this person in person? When was the last time that you talked with them? I mean, like part of me was, was overjoyed about the, the, the level of intention behind the bank trying to stop it. But part of me was also annoyed because I just want the transfer to go through, but, yeah. but, but ultimately I was really happy with it. Are there things that consumers should be doing if they're particularly concerned about, I don't know, their parents, Hey mom and dad, let's move you over to this bank, which has tighter, you know, uh, fraud restrictions in place than maybe some other bank. Are there things that consumers should be asking their banks? Like, Hey, are there additional levels of security you can turn on to help prevent my, you know, my aging mom or my aging grandma from becoming a victim where we're going to make it so she has to jump through an extra step or two and hopefully talk to a human being, which will talk her out of uh, sending money to that Nigerian prince. Um, yes. And uh, by the way, Chris, you look like a fraudster. When you, <laughs> if you open up an account and then the oh, absolutely. You money internationally right after you wait for it to clear. Oh yeah. I mean, she wasn't only making sure you were not getting harmed. She was making sure the bank wouldn't get harmed. So, so, so yeah, I mean, you, you yeah, entirely, that was a total fraudster move. Um, so, so it was good. She did that. And, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that in 2023, a lot more of, are you sure you want to send this? Yeah. Let us call you. Let us talk to you beforehand. So there, there, there are a couple of things for parents and for, uh, for your for your older parents who may get scammed, um, and then also for your kids, we'll talk about both here. So for your parents, yeah, you, you don't want them to have the capability of sending out a a a P to P, a peer to peer payment, right? So a, a Venmo or a Zelle, right? Those are great products. I use them all the time. You know, especially if you have kids in college, right? They're wonderful. Um, but yes, for your parents, I think what I would say is I don't want them to have wire transfer. And I don't want them to have a Zelle account, right? And I think, uh, or Venmo, right? And, and both of those companies, great companies. Um, but you definitely want to get out ahead of them having the ability of sending money out, mm -hmm. right? So I think for, for your parents, you definitely want to do that. If the bank says, well, we can't shut off, we can't shut that off for them, or they could go in and turn it on. Now, if, you know, if their parents, they may not be able to turn it on because they don't know technology that well. Um, but uh, yeah, I would just I would try and make sure wire transfers and P2P brought is something they 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 can't uh, do on their own. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's for parents, you know, all of us with kids. I have five kids um, and I've I've uh, I've not done this. so I'm not taking my own advice. But so this the interesting thing in 2011, 
the SSA, this uh, Social Security Administration, who administers SSNs, right, um, our Social Security numbers, uh, they started randomizing those numbers. Um, before 2011, um, there was some intelligence to it. So I can, all, I can tell you, you know, you were born in the state of Texas, and I can yep. tell you how old you were from the, from the range, right? And there was a research paper that was written where um, uh, we could uh, recognize and, and almost identify what a social was uh, because it wasn't randomized, right? We could right. almost guess it, right, within a, a certain kind of number. I actually helped on that research paper. Um, and after that research paper was written and came out, the SSA changed it to random numbers. So everybody after 2011, it's a randomly generated number. Fraudsters love those numbers because they look like they're an immigrant using a randomly generated number. So one of the things that kids, that parents can do with kids is as soon as they get their social, call the bureaus and freeze their credit report, right? So that nobody can establish a credit in that social's name because once your son or daughter turns 18, they may find they already have a credit report, yeah. really bad credit with their social, right? So it's something that can be done um, in that white paper that I wrote for synthetic fraud. You know, I, I do think it um, uh, several years ago, the SSA went to enumeration at birth. So uh, we don't have to walk into an office when your kid turns seven, right? It, now it, it really just happens at birth. And I would love to see the government just place a security freeze on any of those new ones, right? And then let the cons the, yeah. the parents kind of take that off. So that's two things they can do with, with parents is... Uh, Oh my God. I mean, is really be careful of the mail. I mean, the mail is, is worrisome too. Right. Um, and, and I know that, you know, oftentimes, uh, elderly want to be on the phone, want to be talking. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they're easy, easy to be scammed. Young kids are easy to be scammed. You know, a lot of people are easy to be scammed. Do you think there would be a, a greater uptick in credit freeze? If that was like, you're saying, if that was the default when a social security number was created, I know with uh, like uh, retirement contributions, if companies by default, we're going to put you in, uh, we're going to have you participate in the in the retirement plan unless you say no versus we're not going to put you in unless you say yes, that almost everybody just goes, oh, well, okay, I guess I'll just save my money. Would there be that same effect, do you think, with social security numbers and that should be what the process is? You know, I don't know, because I think, you know, there's always um, there's always consumer privacy concerns. Right. And and what what bothers me may not bother somebody else. And what, you know, doesn't bother me may bother somebody else. So even even for me to say, hey, the government should be able to put a security freeze on it to protect that social. Right. Um, right. At enumeration at birth. Um, I think that would be uh, I think it'd be wonderful. Um for two things, one for the for the for the kid, right? When he or she turns 18, 18 and their credit age, they they literally could walk into a bad credit report, right? And yeah. they've done nothing, right? So 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 that's one. Secondly, it would take away uh, one of the tools of the fraudsters, right? Um, they're they're um, they're called CPNs, consumer protection numbers or something, privacy mm -hmm. numbers. Um, is kind of a made up term that they use in credit repair. Um, but it, it, it would take away one of the tools of fraudsters. And, you know, for me and for the countless people that fight fraud, uh, you take away a tool from a fraudster, you know, I'm like, thank you very much. So, but that that's one of the 10 things that I put in, like synthetic fraud has been around for 20 something, 22 years. Um, you know, and we can eradicate it. Um, it, 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 it. It's something we can get rid of. Um, and so, that's one of the 10 points uh, that I included in that white paper was, gosh, I wish we could do this at enumeration at birth because that would take away one of the tools and make stopping synthetic fraud that, that much closer. Mm -hmm. So are, are, are some of these, I know you had talked about legislation to uh, make things a little more difficult as far as the Zelle transactions. And obviously if the, the bank has a risk then they're going to put a mitigation process in place for that risk. And it's probably the right thing to make. Uh, as soon as someone's on the line for the money, they're going to do something to protect the money. Do you, are there other legislation that you think needs to happen around identity to make it more secure and less prone to uh, theft or fraud? Um, 
There's a couple other things that I think can be done. So there, there, there's so when you talk about credit repair, right? There, there's there are products in the market, um, especially now with fintech. So financial technologies, where I open up an app, I try and make it to where you can build your credit, right? Um, there is a, a new group of credit builder solutions that are responsible. Um, they are really there to help consumers. I mean, down to their core, you know, they're they're a fintech, you know, they're venture capital back. They want to make money, but down to their core, they want to help consumers, right? So that's a that's a credit builder product. There's some of those things that are out there today. We we help them stop fraud. Um, then there's credit repair, and so credit repair uses a couple of tools that I, I don't want to go into them because I don't want to ex explain to people how to commit fraud. But if I if I told you these tools, you would be uh, upset and you would say, I, I promise you, your, the first words out of your mouth, Chris, Chris, would be, isn't that illegal? And I would say, no, it's not, unfortunately. So, so there's a couple things that can be done on the internet um, that these credit repair organizations, the ones that are illegitimate, right? The ones that aren't uh, good guys. They, they have taken advantage of. And so I would like to see the, the government sees it's going on. They're kind of, you know, locked up because it's not illegal. So can they really stop them? So I, I'd like to see some of the things being done in credit repair um, to go away. That's going to take some regulatory changes. Uh, uh, you know, that that's that's something that needs to be done. Um, but but beyond that, I think I think the the. The number one thing that's going to be done that has not been done yet, right? And this is like me before Facebook saying, gosh, if there was a social network with pictures on it, and people go to do it, right? Um, I think at some point there's going to be a company and it, you know, I don't know if it's going to be uh, an Apple or a Google or uh, a Secure or somebody else, right? I don't know. I don't know what brand it's going to be, but it's going to be somebody who can capture the consumer's imagination enough to where that consumer wants to store their identity here mm -hmm. on the phone, right? And the consumer can basically say, and the whole system is set up in a way that says, look, hey, if if you want to get Mike's stuff, you let me know, right? Today, I don't need that. Your data is everywhere. It's, all, yeah. it's out on the internet, but it's also in public record information. It's in the credit bureaus. It's in marketing databases, right? It, it's all, it should be right here. And, and if you want it, you should come to me. I should permission it to you. Yeah. I should give you a token that says how long you can have it, right? If it's an instant or not, right? So I think that that is something that will get there. Getting consumers to adopt it is like getting consumers to adopt a Facebook or uh, Instagram, Snapchat for young kids or, you know, Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> right? So Maybe it will or won't be around. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe something new, but, but um, right. So it really is. I think that's, that's the next thing, but there are, um, you know, the, the government and industry work together um, when things, when the, when the industry can do more, the government generally here in the U S will say, Hey, we're thinking about regulating you. Right. And then the banks, especially here in the U S right. I mean, they're smart enough. They're like, look, we don't want to get regulated. Yeah. Right. Cause then there's a written law and I have to follow it. I'm going to self-regulate and then I'm going along with the spirit of the law. So the, the fines are probably less. So it, it is a, you know, people can be cons conspiracy theorists or hate big banks or, you know, but there is this common understanding that, you know, we, we have to do good for consumers. Yeah. Uh, we have to keep uh, the, the economy afloat. Right. And, so people, I think, do their best. So you had mentioned a uh, a report that you had worked on. Is that something that's available to the public? It is. If they, if they go to secure.com um, and go to the publications resources section um, and then white papers, there is, um, there is a new report we just put out about three weeks ago um, on synthetic fraud. And it's interesting. Um, so synthetic fraud, I've been watching for over 20 years. Um, and I've uh, been paying attention to the behaviors. And so basically 20 plus years ago, fraudsters would set it up and it was all about, let me steal money fast. Let me, yeah. let me get that phone and then ship it to Europe. Let me get a credit card and run it up. Right. So then, uh, so then they got smarter over time and they started doing something called bust out, right. Where 
which means I'm going to be patient. I'm going to, I'm going to run this card up and run it up and run it up. And then I'm going to eventually take it for $20,000 on a $10,000 credit line because of the way I kind of work the system. So the, that's kind of been the behavior and the behavioral changes over the last 20 years. Um, just since COVID, uh, synthetic fraud patterns have changed drastically. We did a three-year study. We were curious on, hey, it seems like synthetic fraud is, is changing. What's going on? So we looked at it. We looked across all these different industries. And what we found is that you know, some fraudsters are using synthetic identities in deposit accounts where they can't really make a lot of money, but they can use it to fuel fraudulent money movement. So again, the, the term, the money mule, right? And so they've created these money mules. So, um, you know, for consumers that may be interested in it, synthetic fraud is an, it's a, it's an interesting fraud, right? Because it's fake. It's an entirely yeah. fake identity and uh, it's neat to, to understand it. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing I think for consumers is, you know, please don't click on things, you know, recognize that, uh, uh, these guys have gotten so much smarter um, in that if you don't click on something, your world's not going to stop. If you don't return a phone call, your world's not going to stop. If you hang up on a government person who's yelling at you about going to fine you and they need, you know, hang up the phone and don't answer it, you, you're not going to go to jail. Yeah, and and I and I've seen more and more uh, public information in terms of you know the IRS will never call uh, unless you're working with unless you're already working with the IRS they will never call you, so you're perfectly safe hanging up uh, on someone who claims to be from the IRS. Yeah, and <laughs> and deleting that text, you know, get rid of that email. And now pay attention to the mail. That's the, that's the interesting thing, right? I mean, this, this came to me from the IRS this is days ago, right? And it, it was a piece of mail that, you know, in my, from my perspective was fraud, right? And so right when you think you've got fraudsters whipped and you tell them, you know, don't answer the phone, they send you a piece of mail. Yeah. I, I, w I was wondering when they would start moving back to paper mail it's like, well, if we can't be the IRS over the phone, we can't be the IRS via email. We're just going to go back to paper mail and get you that way. Absolutely. Hey, and they're patient. They'll get you. Uh, so as we wrap up here, if people want to find you online or your company online, where can they find them? Uh, uh, companies on uh, secure.com, S-O-C-U-R-E.com. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn. If you type in Mike Cook um, at Secure, uh, you can find me just connect me through there. Awesome. And we will make sure to link uh, the report, your uh, the report that you created in the show notes, because people have a hard time figuring out. Uh, I can never write down URLs when I'm listening to them. Yeah. Well, good. Well, Chris, hey, listen, I appreciate the time and, and I appreciate what you do. And, uh, you know, if if we can stop one person, you know, uh, from, from being a victim of fraud, like my daughter was, uh, you know, it makes this time well worth it. So thank you for, for allowing me to be on. Yep. Our, our values are definitely on, in alignment. Anything that I can do to, to help stop fraud is, is the total reason this podcast exists. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.